All right, I'm here with Gary Cardone. Gary is an entrepreneur, he's uh, an investor, he's a philosopher and a very talented artist. Gary, welcome. Wow, I've never been called a philosopher before. That's a new one. Well, you. you know, we'll talk about your background and your studies and you know, it's kind of it's kind of what it is, you know, some of the things that you've done and studied, but uh anyways, we're going to talk about Bitcoin, we're going to talk about uh, you know, the macroeconomic environment, we're going to talk about blockchain and uh, exciting uh, venture that you're working on in that space. So why don't you, for the people that don't know you, why don't you just give us a little brief background about, you know, what you've done and, uh, you know, what you're working on now. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Really appreciate uh, having this time with you. Um, I'm a economics and marketing background in school. Uh, spent the first 22 years of my life in the energy business, uh, helping deregulate the natural gas complex in uh, the US and Canada, the UK. Um, I spent 10 years in the UK building a couple of large businesses for what would become a Fortune 30 company. I was lucky enough, fortunate enough to know that that was the right platform for me. Um, retired from that business when I was 42 in 2001. Uh, predicted the demise of the energy trading markets, thought the market had pretty much flattened out. I'd spent a good 20 plus years of my life. And I thought, hey, you know, I can either stay in this business because this is the industry I built my career on, or I could take what I've learned here, take some time off study myself. Maybe that's the philosophical part. I, I have spent a lot of time uh you know, just looking at myself as a human being and also looking at other people as human beings and history and how people kind of respond and react the same way over and over and over and thought maybe I should uh, challenge uh, the, the normal career path. And I think I'm done with this industry. Let me walk away, study some other things. I can always create another industry or another career. I uh, took four or five years off and ran into a lady who dragged me into the payments industry. She didn't really know how to commercialize her business. <clears throat> Started helping her in about 06. And uh, we, she and I built a, a disputes business called Chargebacks 911 that's become a really big business. I exited that, started exiting it about four years ago, which is when I started studying Bitcoin and blockchain. Uh, it actually... Uh, the business itself was such a successful business. It, it didn't allow me the time to put the energy and focus into Bitcoin and blockchain. Uh, really wished I had done that back in 16 because there would have been a, 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 a uh, an earlier opportunity to get into this space. And I don't think that, I think people get into this space when they deserve it and when they're ready. Um, and that, that was true of me. I spent the last, probably four years really deep in this space. It's about the only thing I really look at anymore is an industry is blockchain, crypto, digital assets, and Bitcoin. And I think those are all really different things. Uh, I happen to believe that we are on the precipice of 50 years of technology that's like we're, we're dripping water, right? Water drop, water drop, water drop until it's a waterfall. I think we're at the precipice of this edge of falling over the waterfall into uh, this digitization of planet Earth, right? Where everything's going to be tracked, measured, accounted for, um, and determine whether it's a good value or not, which should be really, really, because I think there's been a lot of inefficiencies with Web 1.0 and 2.0, um, and, and we can get into some of that. So that's kind of been my career. I, I, I'm, uh, I don't have a lot of hobbies. Uh, people think I'm pretty boring because I find business to be really fascinating. Uh, I find the people that participate in businesses to be really fascinating. And it doesn't require me to have big muscles and, and uh, run fast or some kind of special, unique physical tool. I can just use my mind and stay really excited and interested with people that, that I'm attracted to. Yeah, that's awesome. So you spent, you did spend a period of time you studying philosophy, religion, things like that. Yes, sir. So was that after you exited the uh, oil industry? When did you do, when did you do that? You know, um, funny enough, I have done this since I was about nineteen. I, I think uh, my dad died when I was uh, ten years old, and and that really uh, 
you can see a linear change in the way uh, I live my life. It, it, like I became a problem. Uh, and we can, you, we can go into the psychological reasons of that. I just think I, I did not have an alpha dog around me. Um, well, and you lost your older brother too, right? Yeah, and then five years after I lost my dad, uh, my brother died in a tragic oil and gas uh, accident. Uh, so, you know, you, you learn very quick that there is no guarantee. Um, but I found myself at 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, really lost. And so I started seeking outside help, right? I go to psychologists, go to a training program, meet some man who, you know, was running male training programs for guys that needed to be more responsible. I mean, I've, I've probably spent a million dollars just helping myself, reading, writing, attending seminars. Uh, none of that has ever hurt me to know myself. Uh, I mean, one of my favorite books in the whole world is The Art of War. And, you know, the key is know your enemy, but first know thyself. Uh, knowing the enemy is like useless if uh, you don't know who you are and your own weaknesses and strengths. So I think I've probably been doing that ever since I was, you know, damaged in that death uh, from, my, from my family, uh, from my dad uh, that wasn't expected uh, and learn that life is, uh, that there's no guarantees in life, right? You got to be prepared. This is where the anti-fragile piece comes from me. Like, I, I really believe that all the difficulties that uh, me and my brother have been through, uh, and I don't think they've been extreme difficulties. I mean, I think there's a lot of people in the world that live much, much diff more difficult lives than, than uh, I have. Uh, but I do think that there's some value in that damage that was done, right? That trauma. Because uh, it's the only difference in me, my brother, and other people that are related in the same area. The, the only difference was that pain. Um, like we've got other, uh, not siblings, but uh, other relatives that grew up extremely, uh, well, quite wealthy, not extremely wealthy, but wealthy, comfortable, both of the family members were there. And those guys have not gone on to do anywhere near, uh, made the nearly the impact that my brother and I made, whether that's right or not. I mean, I'm not judging that, I'm just saying that two boys that did not have a Harvard education have gone on to do pretty well, both fell from the same tree and had this pretty much the same experiences, took very different paths in life. I mean, extremely, like 180 degrees difference in our pathways, but we both, you know, figured it out. And I think some of that was from the training and education my dad and mom gave us and maybe him dying really glued that in, right? I mean, that's what I think happened is that all the images I had of him as being a champion of the world, I thought business people were the leaders of the planet. That was a you know, massive loss I had to suffer and experience that, oh, well, actually people in business aren't leaders of anything. They're just trying to make a, a living. <laughs> Most of them are just trying to make a living, which is part of the problem, right? Um, and that's what got me to leave at 41 years old. I was making $7 million a year. And that was the only reason I was staying. I was running a huge business, 600 people in London. I owned all the natural gas storage in the United Kingdom. If you were ExxonMobil and you wanted to store natural gas, you had to call me. I mean, for me, that was the pinnacle of success. But I wasn't really happy. I was like, hey, why am I doing this? And it was only because the ego and the $7 million and my fear that I couldn't recreate myself into another industry. And so I took the plunge. I've always done that, though. I'm really good at pulling the trigger and, and in a way that maybe other people aren't really, really comfortable with. Uh, Cause I just don't see a lot of downside. I, I'm not going to work every day for a 401k. To me, that's crazy, right? I'm already dead if that's the reason I'm working. So from that perspective, I think studying myself has been really good. Um, and that's I, why I say philosopher. So you did study psychology, philosophy and religion. And, you know, I've gotten to know you. We met on Twitter spaces and uh, I was I was fortunate enough to spend some time with you a couple of weeks ago. I was in Florida on business and we got together and broke bread. And, and you know, I've gotten to know you a little bit since then. 
and you're, you know, you're a very deep thinker, but the way that you think and how you process thought to me is very interesting. And, you know, uh, and a lot of that, you've just explained where that kind of comes from and that, that perspective, but I really enjoy that about your intellect and, and how you process information and thought. Oh, thank you. So you were over there in the energy business. So let's talk about BRICS for a second. You know, you were in the middle of all that, right in the thick of it. So what are your thoughts on, you know, BRICS? Uh, you know, that's been going on for a long time. I think 2009 when they had the first meeting and they, you know, all this de-dollarization talk. So what are your, what are your thoughts there? Well, I'm going to answer the question in a way that's probably not normal. Uh, but let, let's look at the EU, okay? Let's look at the EU as a construct. Uh, when I was in England starting in 92, they started that whole process of, uh, hey, let's get the European Union to look like America. Um, the problem with that whole construct is that you're, you're jamming 15 countries together, give or take a few, that all have a very different culture. Many of them have different language. All of them have different language. Uh, they have thousand years of history of beating each other up, stealing each other's wives, kings, queens, gold. <clears throat> I mean, when you go into the United Kingdom, I, I remember taking my uh, bosses from uh, Dynegy into uh, Parliament for a private tour by Lord Mucky Mucky. Uh, ex-energy minister, lovely man, Colin Moynihan. Um, and we were going through there and uh, looked at both of my bosses and I said, you understand that nothing in this building did this country build, make, or resource. This is all stolen, um, pilfered, raped, pillaged, right? I mean, this is all war. These are war instruments right here. Uh, and it really dawned on me when I said that, wow, I know very little about how the world has really come about, but here's the United Kingdom who's held on to a monarchy for who knows how long. And nothing they have in this building is theirs, right? It's all been stolen and taken. Uh, it's pretty staggering, really. So this has been going on a long time. These reorganizations of geology or ge geography. Uh, I think the EU, when the, when the United Kingdom um, you know, busted out of their their uh, the EU and did the the Brexit. Uh, I don't think they were ever in the EU. Okay, like they never transferred the power to be able to create their own currency into the EU, where France, Germany, all everybody else, Italy, Portugal, Spain, everyone else had to convert to the EU to the euro uh, currencies. They had priorly been able to create themselves. Uh, but the UK went into the Brexit for passport control and some other reasons, um, but did not bring their currency in there. And then when Brexit blew apart, I think it really showed you that, that uh, one, I think that's going to be really good for the United Kingdom because it's left Germany holding up the entire complex of the EU. That is now failing uh, once those pipelines were blown up a year ago, um, can't imagine who blew those up, but once those were blown up, um, you bankrupted germ the, germ the entire German market. The entire German market is bankrupt and no one is speaking about it. All the, your, uh, the German utilities are done. Uh, they're having to pay extreme costs for energy today and, and uh, they're losing they they basically lost all their industry. I think you're going to see Germany turn into a super, super green industry that basically uh, produces uh, an event where it says, look, we all have to bail out the our energy complex and we're going to turn into a purely green hydro type solar uh, industry or community. Uh, and we don't really care what we pay for it. And, and uh, we're headed there very quickly. And the reason we're headed there because they don't have any of their own fossil fuel. That's the reason. Um, so, so it's going to be really interesting. I think Brexit is just a an iteration into that we're going to have five or six different major geography markets. You mean you mean BRICS? BRICS, BRICS. I think the the EU is now because it's falling apart. 
those people are going to have to figure out, hey, how do you handle the 22 million people that have been pushed out of the Ukraine? Most women and children. Um, you know, we were freaking out two years, three years ago when, when a million people hit the European uh, market from ISIS. Now we've hit 22 million people. Similar population of people that are coming into the southern parts of America. They're moving into Europe from the Ukraine zone. Um, I don't know who's going to fund these people. I don't know where the hospitals, housing, and food's going to come from. Um, that's those going to get, you know, pushed out. One, you have a cultural issue. You have a financial issue. Um, you have an integration issue. Like the integration in Europe has not gone well, right? French people living in Spain, Spanish people living in Holland, uh, Turkey people, you know, Turkish people living. So this has not gone well. I don't know um, how you have five people that are running a very large continent can bring all those people together when very few of those people actually know who these five people are. They're not voted into office, right? They're just placed there. Um, so, so I think what's happening, Greg, is that we're having marketplaces, the, the needs of the market itself, People are saying, like, if you're in Saudi Arabia, do you want to have to convert your oil to, to uh, U.S. dollars? Or would you like to have the option if your customer, let's say your customer is in China, says, you know, I want to pay you in something different. Like, like if you called me today and said, Yuri, uh, I, I don't want to pay you in U.S. dollars. I want to pay you in X, Y, Z coin. My answer is going to be, sure, Greg, I'll take it. Like, I'm not going to say no to you. You're my customer. And I think you have customers all over the world now saying, going, you know, maybe I don't want to do all this U.S. dollar stuff. Maybe I want to trade in gold. Maybe I want to trade in Bitcoin. Maybe I want to trade in cigarettes or, hey, I've got some tanks here. I'll sell you my tanks for the food. So we may have a world where people are starting to learn that I don't have to be tied to one thing to trade with. I might want to barter some of my uh, resources, um, whatever those resources are for San Salvador, it might be Bitcoin, right? Yeah, it's pretty interesting because at the end of the day, no matter what currency or asset or commodity they're exchanging for that oil, let's just use oil for an example, it's still going to be priced in dollars at the end of the day. The value calculation is still going to be based on the dollar, even though they're not using the dollar to transact. And then the question becomes, like you said, you have all these players who's assets or currency are you going to be able to rely on if you're going to accept it? And who's going to take it from you if you want to cash it in versus a dollar or Bitcoin, you know, for example, if, if, you know, if that becomes a thing that they try to use. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think everything's going to still be based against, okay, you sold a thousand barrels of oil for X, Y, Z, but how did that translate back into U S dollars to get some common, uh, uh, point, right? Some common uh, thread there that allows somebody to measure one thing against another. This is where I think Bitcoin becomes really, really interesting. If you begin to think about, you know, four or five different markets, physical markets. See, most people think about physical markets. They never think about, hey, what happens if you have a virtual market? It's really difficult for people to think this way. But if you go on Twitter spaces today, for instance, and, and you uh, put in Bitcoin or you put in the, the macro market or put, search anything, you'll find there'll be hundreds of people in a room, in a virtual room, where, in fact, you and I have now developing a relationship with I suspect will last a long, long time that was built in a virtual environment. It, it, like you and I only met three or four weeks ago in my house, uh, but we um, met in a virtual environment on a real conversation. These are not virtual conversations. These are real conversations with real content, but they're done in a virtual manner. I maintain that that three or 400 people to where I met you in, that is a market. It's already a market and it allows you and I to begin to communicate. What is, when I trade, what am I doing? I think money is only for communication. That it, like it's literally allowing us to communicate and transfer 
something between each other that says we have some common language, right? Some common interest. <clears throat> Bitcoin becomes really fascinating to me because if you have four or five markets and you can't think about this in like, oh, next week, you got to think about this in three years or seven years, okay? The, uh, you know, slowly, 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 and then all of a sudden something happens, right? Um, if there's four or five markets that are all trying to, uh, three or four of them are trying to move away from one currency to give themselves more options, which I don't know anyone, country or individual, that doesn't want more options that are price right, right? Do you know anybody that doesn't want more options? or optionality, I don't. Um, Bitcoin becomes really fascinating when you start thinking about someone in Japan or someone in the Middle East that says, you know, I have so much exposure to US dollars now. Gosh, uh, wouldn't it be nice for me to own a home in the United Kingdom and be exposed to the sterling? Well, you, you think that sounds natural, right? You're like, hey, that makes sense, man. Guy's got a bunch of stuff in, in the Middle East. He might be worried about, you know, a new dictator one day and, and he's not part of the club. And maybe he goes buys a house for two million pounds in the United Kingdom. Now he's exposed to sterling, pound sterling. Well, he does that. And then five years later, his son, who's 29, says, Gosh, you know, I, I think we have too much exposure, Dad, to uh, to uh, the, our local currency and our our oil position is so big. We've got homes in the United Kingdom now. Why wouldn't we buy a couple million dollars worth of Bitcoin? See, so so this is a slippery slope that people get on. And, and I think you're beginning to see, if you don't notice how many smart people are beginning to take a percentage of their worth, and say, gosh, I think I want to be outside of the normal currencies and the way the, the market has worked for the last 500 years because we have this new thing called technology. And this technology is allowing us to do things that if we're not careful, we're putting these new goggles on and we're looking at the old world going, wow, how crazy is this? How criminal is this? How... Uh, obscure and, and um, opaque is this marketplace. But the truth is, the legacy world we came from has been really, really good, okay? The centralization, how we've run these markets has been really, really effective, assuming that we don't have technology, assuming we don't have hyper compression and ability to move data very, very quickly. But today we have that now, okay? We have the ability to place things on a blockchain, a public blockchain, which allows everyone to see everything transparently. That has never, ever been available to us before. So what the Bitcoin, the digital community is doing is they're saying, oh, poo-poo on the old world, uh, which is not really fair because the poo-poo is, hey, yep, yeah, that was a great world, and it, it, it probably operated as efficiently as it possibly could have with the tools it had. But today, when you enter transparency, and this is what the World Wide Web did to every business and industry except finance, the World Wide Web introduced transparency at a level we have never seen before. Once you introduce transparency to a market, and this is now global transparency, someone in Nigeria can really go into the blockchain or go into things and see what everyone else is doing if it's transparent. <clears throat> Once that happens, um, one thing always follows, like a formula in chemistry, you begin commoditizing the underlying infrastructure and products in that ecosphere. Transparency leads always to commoditization. Commoditization leads to an increase in volume like 10X, right? Volumes explode. You can look at this in oil, natural gas, electricity, FX, copper, rice, pork bellies, everything, right? Transparency leads to commoditization. Commoditization leads to massive volumes and shrinking margins. 
massive volume, shrinking margins. The legacy players hate the shrinking margins because most of them are public companies working on 90 day quarterly earning reports, which is insane in and of itself. I mean, talk about psychiatric, right? They all, they all should go to the treatment centers because how can you build a billion dollar business on a 90 day earnings platform, right? It, it, it's silly, right? That's your metric. When, when the transparent, the, the legacy players hate the margin collapse, okay? But they forget the volumes explode, right? Always the volumes explode. And, and my point is you cannot have the type of friction that we have had in the old analog age, friction of refunds, force majeure, hey, I don't want this anymore. Hey, I didn't know. Hey, I want you to take it back. Uh, get out of jail free card. Uh, I don't have to pay for that today because all these things are friction, right? Like the payment industry, the credit card industry is, 7 to 13% declines, 8% refunds, 1% chargebacks. These things don't live in a world that's hyper transparent and of massive volumes occurring, okay? Or a commodity style markets. So I think that you're gonna see a lot of people move into the Bitcoin space because it allows for optionality and it allows for all these five geo centers if you believe that Dubai is going to be a center, I happen to believe the Middle East is going to be an important function. I think Japan's going to be, Singapore is going to be interesting. Uh, this part of the world, the Caribbean, is going to have its own marketplace. And I think all those marketplaces will want some common currency or asset that they can judge their performance against. And I think that might be Bitcoin. And I think that's what the maxis are saying. Uh, and I think they're probably right. Uh, I think their timetable might be, you know, 20 years, a little premature. Um, this will take a long time for the 30-year-olds, all the old guys like me that are going to be decaying um, and other people that are going to be taking over. You know, my children have zero allegiance to any bank that you've ever heard of. Any Barclays that has been around 420 years, Coots, uh, the federal, the federal banks, like the entire construct, your children and my children don't give a toss about it. Uh, they want to transact in a virtual world, which is what we're doing right here. Uh, if we had told you we could do this 20 years ago, we would have said, no, this is insane. That's not going to happen, much less have thousands of people on the same show. Uh, look at what's happening to the media, Greg. Media is being dis, just grossly disrupted and no one's talking about it, right? Not really. I think you're seeing the, the philosophy of, uh, of uh, decentralization. Not, not that it's perfect decentralization, but quasi-decentralization quasi is occurring to media faster than it's occurring to the financial industry right now. And once that happens, the rest of this rolls over because I think it's been the media that has been educating the world falsely on what's really happening, what really is true about economics. I think that's why you and I get so excited about this space because economics should be, you know, should be zero plus one is one. Um, but we find that zero plus one is Oh, maybe it's not one in, in this world we live in um, with uh, misinformation, miseducation, confusion, too much data, too little data. Well, so, man manipulation of the financial system itself. Well, and, and not even an open dialogue to anything that's different, right? Like the, 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 the messaging. So when you have so many people, you've got now Tucker, you've got, you've got a lot of people leaving mainstream media, which I don't think anyone understood. And the freaky thing is, I don't know if you, you've been watching this, but everybody's complaining about what they're getting paid from Twitter spaces for having 80 million views. We'll, we'll try this one on. Okay. I mean, I heard this guy the other day, I got 80 million views. I only made 800 bucks. I'm like, dude, that's awesome. Okay. There is no, if you're CNN, Fox, or anyone else, you're like, oh my God, dude, $200, 800 bucks. How can we compete with that? 
Remember, Uber was cheaper than taxis. That is not true anymore. Uber was cheaper than taxis until they got the monopoly. And now their prices are going back up. So when you guys are sitting, I'll take 800 bucks for 80 million views. I'll take zero for 80 million views, quite frankly. Because once that's happened, you have basically cut out the legs of any major corporation that's been working on ridiculous margins. And clearly they have been ridiculous, right? If a guy can get 80 million views for, and only get eight, paid 800 bucks, I'm pretty sure that all the people that have been working at Fox and CNN are grossly overpaid, right? And that's going to be the competition. Now, the question is going to be, does the guy at CNN, is he willing to move from his cushy 401k and all the little stuff they give him, the first class air flights and, you know, all the crap, uh, who, who is it? The guy that left Kitco? Four or five X? David Lou. His income. Okay. By just having the freaking guts, which I really admire that, right? Like I did not know him before, but his willingness is just to walk away from a company like Kitco and go build his own thing. That is available for anyone everywhere. Okay. Now, now you start thinking about, hey, could there be more than four, four geo centers or five geo centers? You know, the Brexits or the, the BRICS. Could there be? I think there could be. I think it's going to be called the virtual world where people like you and I decide, I think we want our own community with our own rules, our own education, our own religious kind of thoughts, right? Our own philosophy. Uh, and, and 8 million pe 8 billion people, Oh, you only need one-tenth of 1% 1 and you got 8 million people in a small little community. You get 400 million people with wallets, supposedly, and digital assets. That is a nation larger than the United States, man. Right? All with one viewpoint. Hey, we like this Bitcoin. We like Bitcoin. We think Bitcoin has a value and has a purpose on the planet. Uh, that's a lot of people. Uh, any way you measure that, if you're even a merchant selling something to someone, you go, whoa, it's a market. 400 million people deep and they're all adults with money. I kind of like that market. Yeah, that's, that's a market you don't want to enjoy. And, you know, we covered a lot there. You know, the decentralization of media, the citizen, the rise of citizen journalism, uh, you know, the ecosystem of instant trustless exchange of value around the world. You know, it's the digitization of everything. When people say, what's the metaverse? To me, we just described it. It's the digitization and the and the, the ability to virtualize the entire world. I, I agree. I mean, I think we are in the metaverse right now. I'm doing the metaverse with you right now. You guys can laugh at it and say, well, it's two dimensional. You know, dude, I'm not wearing any goggles. I don't have anything on my head. I, I, I'm enjoying this. This is just reduced. The amount of money you and I are saving right now having this conversation is staggering. It's staggering, right? And, and we could do this 10 times today if we wanted to, if we found it productive. So we have shortened the distance between buyer and seller. If you think about it, no less than just buyer and seller, we have shortened the proximity between he who can produce something and he who wants to uh, acquire that service or product. This has never happened before, right, for, for humanity. It's never happened where you're basically allowing, you're in, you're in North Carolina, I'm in, I'm in Florida, 800 miles separates us, yet we are in the comfort of our homes having a, 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 a good conversation, right? And... If we wanted to transact right now, we now have a methodology to transact with each other if we choose, which is I could send you some Bitcoin. Well, what's interesting is this virtual relationship <clears throat> that started on Twitter spaces ultimately bridged the 800 mile gap and brought us together in person. Correct. Right. Yeah. Fascinating. Isn't it? Yeah. So uh, let's talk about Bitcoin. Yeah, you, so when did you get started? In 2016. 2016. So you've been through one cycle. 
Uh, obviously, you've studied all the cycles, but you've been through one. So how do you feel right now? Because, you know, in the space for a lot of people, it feels like, man, this is it. It's over. It's lost steam, lost momentum. You know, price is going to go to whatever. So what? Where, how do you feel right now? Uh, well, the more I listen to the pundits, of course, the more nervous I get. Uh, and, and, and the nervous is just about the ego, really, right? The ego, the ego. Hey, am I right? Am I wrong? Um, I think, I think personally, people can overthink things. I, I am not. Uh, I tend to pull the trigger uh, a little bit quicker than most people, and then, and and, and then move on. I, I, I don't. I'm not going to get. I don't even know what the price is today. I suspect it's in twenty five or twenty six. My, so let's start with it. When did you first buy? I bought in, uh, I, my first purchase was around, I, I, I looked at it at 800 bucks and I bought it at 8,000. Uh, so I bought a bunch of gold and I think 18, I bought $2 million worth of gold and I bought a hundred or $200,000 worth of uh, Bitcoin. And you haven't sold any Bitcoin? No. Well, I actually did sell some. I bought I use Bitcoin and Ether to buy Node 40, which is the accounting firm. And then I reloaded. Uh, really great story, actually, about being able to buy Bitcoin, take a tax loss, a uh, large tax loss, move that Bitcoin into buying a company on a Saturday afternoon, um, and then be able to reload that Bitcoin over four months um, at a lower price. So um, I have been accumulating for the last three years, I would say. I am an accumulator, not for sale. I, 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 I am not selling Bitcoin. So I don't really care about the price, right? I care about continuing to be able, in fact, I actually love this price. If you told me, hey, Gary, you bought, 100 Bitcoin and the price is now triple what you bought it for, I actually would be a little, I would be more nervous. Uh, I love being able to accumulate this because I'm not worried about what it does to my money. In fact, I hope it goes to $10,000 um, because it allows me to buy some more. I think this is an unbelievable opportunity that we're, we're getting in front of people able to make a decision about this product line, this new asset class. It's the same thing that's happening that happened with the World Wide Web. I mean, all you have to do is go back and listen to all the experts and they said the World Wide Web was gonna die, okay? That there was no deal in it. No, no merchants were gonna make any money. Um, you know, it was just a Ponzi scheme for drug dealers and, and pornography. Uh, um, you know, maybe pornography and drug dealing and all the, the shady stuff is what all industries are created on in the beginning. But today we have real legitimate people coming into the space. So I intend for my, look, I have a very, very basic premise. I was with Anthony, Anthony Scarmucci for dinner one night and, and he said, hey man, you, you think this is gonna, cause he got a big position and uh, I think this is gonna be okay. And I, and I said, look, my view is this. Um, I'm buying this for my children. They will get it when they're 30 or 35 years old. I've got 15 to 20 years before that happens. My premise is that Bitcoin's worth more in 15 years than it is today. If for no other reason, because the US dollar is degrading in value. As all currencies have ever degraded in value, this one is also degrading in value. It will continue to degrade in value. That is one of the characteristics of political currency, what's known as fiat. Political currency is always produced, overproduced, overmade, because that's what gets politicians jobs. Okay, if I if I ran for office tomorrow and told everyone that we were going to go through a major depression for the next three years, <laughs> we were going to go on the gold standard, and everyone was going to suffer, I wouldn't get a vote. Okay, so people are going to vote for free money. And, and, and uh, they always have, and they probably always will. And I like having a portion of my net worth in Bitcoin 
because I think it's a good decision. Now, what if it's a bad decision? What if it goes to zero? I have assumed it will go to zero. See, see, I'm not over trading my position, so I don't have to get nervous, right? Like I own some, uh, I mean, I own some uh, aquarium equipment here that I know is outdated. Well, I don't, I'm not going to sell it and start over. I'm going to use it till it dies. So, so I don't have to throw everything out in the kitchen sink. I'm not saying that I'm a 1000% Bitcoin or that my house has to be converted to Bitcoin. My car has to be like, I hear this stuff and I'm like, oh my God, I have a position in Bitcoin that if it goes to zero, my children will grow up exactly like me with nothing. And they'll probably have less of a problem than if Bitcoin's worth a million dollars. If Bitcoin is worth a million dollars, then they have a much bigger problem to solve, right? Which is how to be a decent human being with a shitload of money and actually make a difference on this planet. Yeah, give it so, away. So that, that's my view. I hear guys all freaked out about Bitcoin. They're day trading this stuff, okay? And, and good luck to you, man. I did this for a profession for 22 years. Most people I have met are not designed to be day traders. I, and when I say most, I mean 99% of them are not designed to be day traders, much less in this particular environment. Well, you know, most of it is gambling. You know, it's a lot of people that have never been through a business cycle. Most of them have never been through any kind of a bear market, any kind of a recession. And it was, you know, a lot of people just born out of the pandemic that took the stimulus money, started messing around. Crypto was exciting. So you, know, you have a lot of gambling. And then, you know, there's some people that have educated themselves and, you know, are doing pretty well trading. And there's people that got lucky, bought it at, well, you say lucky, but they understood it, got the information and bought it at a price. And it just... It just went nuts and, and they were able to capitalize. But a lot of those people never thought it would ever be where it's at now either. Uh, so it's it's interesting the different things you have. Yeah, it's all about time horizon. It's all about position. So you've got some Bitcoin, you've got some gold. Uh, and I know you've, you know, you've spread out into some other things as well for longer term, you know, storage of wealth. How do you feel about gold, uh, you know, versus Bitcoin? And, you know, where, where does that decision come into play in terms of the, you know, the the, the wealth storage? Well, I've actually sold most of my gold. Uh, sold it at 19. I uh, bought it for 1100, held it for eight years. I think that's not a great return, but my my dollar position didn't, you know, I didn't lose money. I, I made a double. Okay, whatever. Uh, I have sold my gold. And the reason I sold my gold, I think gold has a limited price that it can go to. At four thousand, it's what's it at right now? Nineteen hundred, nineteen fifty. At four thousand dollars, I, I think you'll see most all the gold uh, that are sitting in teeth and around people's necks, you know, melted down. Um, and then at five thousand dollars, how much can you mine? Right? I mean, have we ever seen technology get slower? No, I haven't. Okay, I just see technology. I mean, the oil guys at $10 a barrel figured out how to frack. That's when they figured out how to frack, okay? When prices were in the dirt, they didn't stop drilling. They started drilling smarter. So people that look for fossil fuel, look for fossil fuels. People that mine gold, mine gold. The cool thing about Bitcoin is it doesn't matter if the price is a jillion, gazillion dollars. You can't mine anymore. See, this is the only, like, name a product like this. There has never been a product with a algorithmic finite supply, can't be changed, um, with 304,000 ultra-wealthy players on this planet, 62 million millionaires, and 21 million coins that cannot be mined outside of a certain time boundary. Like, I don't know what anybody's waiting for, okay? Like, there isn't any other product like that. There's no governor, there's no president, there's no prime minister or king that runs this industry. It's millions of people sitting on laptops and computers, um, all having access to the same blockchain, and the, meaning the same ledger, Imagine being able to have the ledger to go into Bank of America, 
okay, or Goldman, and be able to see that ledger wide open for everyone, or the Fed. Uh, this is why CBDCs, all these little government products and projects that are being discussed will be completely different than Bitcoin and will actually help Bitcoin. Okay, because you're going to show everyone what a private blockchain looks like, and then you're going to show everyone what Bitcoin's public blockchain looks like. And I am pretty certain that the CBDCs will not be on a public blockchain. If it is, there'll be another blockchain ledger that's the real ledger. Uh, and maybe, maybe you think I'm being you know suspicious. I just don't think the government's uh, not in the not in this century going to put everything on the public blockchain. I think there's too many secrets to hide from the past that the analog world would allow you to hide. See, see you, you can't even think about it as being suspicious. It's just that market allowed you to hide a lot of stuff. And, and these two worlds are just like, it's completely different. I don't even know how, you know, we're gonna have some struggles here because I think you're literally just moving into a completely different dimension that much of the baggage that comes from the guys moving from the old world to the new world, they, they just have too much baggage, like mark to market. Like wh why is the commercial real estate market right now? Everybody's freaked out about it because the moment one of these big properties sells and we mark this thing, everybody has to mark their books. Okay. That's why no sales are occurring. Not really, not really any big sales. Um, once these prices have a print, right? I used to call Enron because I knew they were, you know, playing with their numbers. I used to call, call Enron on my way home in London. I'd go, hey, I uh, want to make a market with you. Market's close, seven o'clock at night. Oh yeah, okay, Gary, what you want to do? Uh, I want to do a, uh, I'm going to do a bid offer spread on 500 megawatts in Germany, five years. Buy or sell 500 megawatts every day for five years, no matter what happens, right? Um, okay, what's your price? Uh, my price is 2205 at 2210. Now, dude, a nickel, a nickel spread on a 500 megawatt five-year project. They hung the phone up, okay? Like the last thing, a guy that has some contracts sitting over here that don't have a mark, meaning that there's no clear price for that. Like crude oil today is $78.32. Let's pretend that's the right number. That's, that's the number. If you own crude oil, that's what you're pricing it at. But if you owned a power station for five or six years in Germany that had five years output, what's that price? There is no price for that because there's no market for that. It's a huge deal. The last thing Enron wanted was, oh shit, I got to show a 2205 or 2210 price because they had marked it some other fictitious number that they got their accounting department to agree to because cost basis. My cost is this, therefore I should deserve a margin of this. That's not the way real markets work. So that, that's, I think that's where we're headed is. We're, we're headed into a world of ultra transparency we have to, in order for our world to work correctly, big volumes with everyone connected, I think you have to have transparency. Otherwise, you break the whole concept of a commoditized environment. Transparency leads to commoditization. Commoditization leads to a reduction in margins and an increase in volume. Caveat, cannot have friction. It, it just, there, there is no friction. There is no friction in the crude oil markets today when you're trading. There's no defaults. There's no chargebacks. Oh, there's a hurricane. Sorry. You know, there's a hurricane rolling right through the Gulf of Mexico right now. If ExxonMobil sell crude oil next Saturday uh, to anyone, they have to show up with it or make the delta up in the money, right? There is no, oh gosh, my well, my well stopped performing. So what, dude, that's your problem. Right. That's a perfect market. And I think Bitcoin's a perfect market. And I think that's a, a reason a lot of people won't want to play in this market. Right. Because you don't get a margin call. You don't even get the call. Dude. You just get liquidated. So I can build the case. There's still a lot of guys like me and you that still will use the legacy market. 
right? Because I mean, last year I got margin called, I think seven, six or seven times for bit my Bitcoin position. And, and the call went like this, hey man, what you gonna do here, dude? You're underwater, give me five days. Okay, we'll give you five days. That doesn't happen in Bitcoin. Poof, you're liquidated, which is beautiful, right? There's been no defaults in Bitcoin, not one. Not one default in Bitcoin. People get liquidated. Um, and that is why some people won't want to play in the market, right? Because it's a real man's market, uh, if I can say that today, that it's a man's market. Let's talk about existential threats. So, you know, Bitcoin's decentralized. We've got miners all around the world, like you said. But there's a play now with the ETFs and the institutions that are the largest miners in the world right now uh, that are gaining more and more hash rate share. So, you know, is that becoming more centralized? And do you see a potential threat if a handful of large institutions, because, you know, the mining business model only works if Bitcoin is at a price that you can mine and sell it. Eventually, you're going to run out. Eventually, you know, the price like right now is below cost with energy costs, things like that. Currently, when you take overhead, you take energy costs, you take real estate, taxes, everything it takes to operate a Bitcoin mining facility, a professional industrial facility, your break even is about 30K. So miners have been capitulating. That's what's driving a lot of this lower price action. They have to sell to stay alive. A lot of them borrow money you know, to get where they're at, you, you know, they're facing potential liquidations and things. So if the price doesn't rise soon and doesn't stay elevated, then Bitcoin mining is not sustainable for the average mining operation. But the big institutions like BlackRock, well, they, they're unlimited. So if they have a play in mind, well, let's gain, you know, the percentage of the, or the bulk of the market share in the mining space. Does that worry you at all down the road for the future of Bitcoin as an asset? Or do you think that enhances it? I think if 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 uh, the scenario that you just played out that BlackRock could you know be the king of the ETF and own all the mining, I you know sure that's a problem that will never be allowed. You're not going to be able to run an ETF and own all the miners. Um, I, I don't think politically or, or legally that 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 works. But I actually build the case that the miners and with all due respect to the people in the mining industry, I'm not convinced that world is as stable uh, as a place setting as it might appear to be. I, I actually think uh, most of the pricing going into producing Bitcoin is grossly overpriced. Okay, why, why anyone would be paying seven and a half cents a kilowatt to produce Bitcoin unless it's the absolute only option. And then even then it makes no sense because look, my, my view is all and gas companies are going to be the, the, the miners of this product. And, and the reason is they already are long this product. They're long fossil fuel and fossil fuel will be, in my opinion, what drives Bitcoin not solar. It makes no sense for solar or water when geothermal, unless it's trapped, has no other options. Like I could see, okay, there's a mine in, you know, Hawaii, a volcano, and it's like, it's producing a lot of geothermal and, you know, they're, they're, we don't do anything with it. So therefore it's a stranded asset or a waterfall in Nowhereville. Uh, or maybe, you know, Putin's got uh, up in Siberia has half a billion cubic feet a day that's produced into the atmosphere every day because it's it got nowhere to go. Uh, by the time that gets to Europe, assuming there's a pipeline, oh, oh, what well, it requires a pipeline too, right? Shit requires a pipeline, it requires a ship. Um, why not just take all the stuff that's sitting in the in, in Siberia and, and maybe he has a net back. A net back is if the price of nat gas is three dollars, and you're producing this in Oklahoma, what is the net back price to the wellhead? The wellhead price is not $3. The wellhead price is $3, Henry Hub, minus all the transport and refining costs. Well, if you're in Dakota at 25 cents at the wellhead, that's where the mining is gonna happen. It's not gonna happen at a central point in Texas. These are experiments right now. 
like like the oil and gas producer, they'll spend half a billion dollars. Hey, can we do this? Can we mine this stuff? What happened? Where are they going to do it? They're not going to do it in Dakota. They're going to go into central Texas or Louisiana or Oklahoma, where they have the facility. They're going to do a test. They don't give a toss at what it costs. While you got these guys up all disaggregated, disintermediated players with six cents per kilowatt, four cents per kilowatt. 23% of all fossil fuel is wasted. Now, how much of that's flared? Uh, I just think that it uh, that the Bitcoin mining is going to be attracted by the lowest cost inputs. And, and uh, I have never invested in a miner because I'm like, man, you're going to have to get your input costs down. Why would you want to be a part of that? If you want to own Bitcoin, why wouldn't you? If you're telling me right now it's break even is 30, Dude, you've got to buy this product at 26. If the break even is at 30, okay, because you're putting capital cost in there and everything. Uh, it's funny, now people are starting to talk about capital costs. Four years ago, it's like, oh no, capital cost, it's zero. Now it's, ooh, 7%. So I don't think this is going to get mine the way people are suggesting it's going to get mine. I, I think. And why, why would you want to use green energy? If you could use energy that's being pushed into the atmosphere in Saudi Arabia or, or in, in uh, Russia, and it's getting zero, and they're probably paying carbon credits for it, they're going to buy carbon credits against their, their flaring, uh, isn't that zero cost? It can exactly. be. I mean, you're still going to have some operational costs. You got to, you got to, you, know. you already have, you already have those operational costs. But if you can eliminate the biggest cost, which is energy, then, and, then and, yeah. capital. and capital, because right. the, the capital, the capital is going to, going to get offset by the carbon uh, expense that you're paying. I, I just think that, that you're not, I mean, look, they're trying to build homes in, in boxes now, right? Like, we have technology now that we've never been confronted with. People are like, hey, I can create, Elon's like, hey, I can create a small home in a box. Okay. And, and, and we can do it in scale. Yeah, push a button and it unfolds. Yeah. But, but if, you're not thinking, if you're not thinking with that, right? If you're not thinking with, wow, the world's really changed. Like, I could not have moved three and a half million dollars on a Saturday afternoon five years ago. Dude, I, only if I had a plane and some cash. Now, five years later, I moved three and a half million dollars to a guy in New York without any intermediaries, dude. That is, people is, don't really understand the impact of that. Well, Honestly, I've done it internationally. So I've, I, I've done those transactions internationally. You know, I, I mean, instantly outside the country, you know, I've used it for, for, for that. So let's let's pivot to that and talk a little bit about you know, what you're doing there, Node 40, the problem that's solving, you know, and get into the whole blockchain side of things. Because Bitcoin, as you said, and blockchain are very different things and very different spaces. Yeah. Well, uh, if you believe that we're moving into a, uh, without me getting too pitchy on Node 40, okay, Th this is just- no, let's talk about it. I mean, that's a company you're deep in. It's providing yeah. a huge, it's solving a major problem. There was a big article out the other day about the IRS and everybody having to check the box, and I mean that that's that's a real thing. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a it's a real thing, okay. And and, and um, this is where I get really excited about this industry that people talk about. Like, you don't have to buy Bitcoin to be interested in this industry, and, and this this is a really really good example. Um, I happen to own Bitcoin, and it. The only way I learn how to do anything is if I'm actually participating in the game. I have to have some skin in the game to get interested. It's dawned on me now, though, that um, there are a million jobs available in blockchain and Bitcoin in that whole ecosphere industry, of which worthy of note is how many people are moving into this bloody space. Okay, And it's not people that are 16. It's people that are 36 and 46 and 56 and 66 that are coming from other industries, some are making a tremendous amount of money from those industries and they are walking away from them to focus on this. So first off, intellectual capital that's coming into this market is more substantial to me than the money that's coming. It's the brain power, 
right? And the commitment. So that's one thing. Second thing is when there's a million jobs available, the question should be, you know, people go, hey, you, you need to be a part of Bitcoin. You, what they're saying is that, hey, you can be a part of this whole industry. There are a million jobs. Very few of those jobs require prior education or skills. Okay, that, it's not like we can go tap into uh, a city in, in, in Michigan and go, hey, we want to take all your blockchain crypto people out of the school. There aren't anybody. There's not been anyone educated. So, like, literally, if you're 52 years old and you came out of Subways or you just retired from Chevron and you're bored, pick up the white paper, read it start reaching out to people. There's a job for you in this industry to make really good money to help farm it. Then there's the opportunity of, of, of buying companies, building infrastructure, building companies, buying Bitcoin if you want. For me, buying the Bitcoin led to me understanding the industry better. And then what I understood was, oh my God, dude, we're getting ready to digitize everything on planet Earth. It's what I call the digitization of planet Earth where everything will be tracked, traced, accounted for, and measured. We will become a rental society because it makes sense. Not because it's bad, not because Klaus says, we will own nothing and be happy. Okay, it will be because it makes sense. I use my car 4% of the time. It's a horrible utilization of money and, and energy. And it's just a, little, a lot of waste. It's not efficient. I looked at Node 40, uh, met Perry and Sean, and with this premise that everything was going to be tracked, traced, and measured, and realized that no one in the crypto industry had the tools, the dashboards, the understanding, the reports, the analytics, the quality of earnings that you and I have come accustomed to in any other business, whether it's building a business of selling staples or bread or you know, building a business, a technology business to sell to the credit card industry. So looking around, a lot of companies had built tax solutions for small consumers uh, to deal with the tax problems related to crypto, but no one had done this for institutions. Um, and I happen to believe that guys like you and me, uh, you and I are going to want to know what our cost base is every day and no one knows what their cost base is on crypto exactly i you know i ask people that all the time and they have no clue they're doing all kinds of different things especially people that are active or if they're dollar cost averaging nobody has any idea and you know last year when i was trying to get stuff together for taxes you know i primarily use coinbase they couldn't give me consolidated statements they couldn't give me a 1099 i mean this is coinbase they're a public company you know all i could do was download a list of transactions and then i had to create you know, my own thing out of that. Thank goodness I didn't do that much, but it was still hundreds, you know, of transactions and trades and, you know, things like that. Cause I was just kind of playing around, you know, during the, during the bear market and just, you know, first time I was really active trading crypto and I was trading, you know, a bunch of different assets and yeah, it was, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, this is a public company, hundreds of millions of dollars worth billions or whatever the, the market cap is now generating hundreds of millions. And they can't give me a statement like TD Ameritrade or Fidelity or, anybody else in the industry is required to do. Well, and I, I think there's a reason for that, right? There haven't been any institutional players in it. Um, and, and the crypto people uh, have, I think, drank a little too much of their own Kool-Aid. Uh, and, and an example of that would be, hey, we want adoption, we want adoption, and then, you know, Fidelity and BlackRock come into the space, and we're like, oh, we didn't mean that kind of adoption. It's like, you know, did you, adoption means all the big players come in and all the consumers, uh, and guess what they're going to want? The same freaking tools they've had every in every commodity space. Uh, and ability, like, it's become really clear to me that for the educated crypto investor or Bitcoin investor or blockchain uh, investor, sorry, we have hurricane alerts and stuff. Oh, yeah, you got the hurricane bearing down on you. Well, tropical storm right now. Everybody all jacked up already. Um, the, 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 uh, there haven't been any institutions that came along with their own tools. This has been pretty much uh, 
a bunch of non-professionals in this space. Uh, people did not understand that tracking and tracing crypto is very, very different than a legacy asset. And no time or attention was put into solving a problem that had not become a problem yet. I mean, good, good example, 50 million people placed, checked a box on their IRS forms, said we own a digital asset. 896,000 of them pay taxes. So less than 1 50th of those that hold digital assets have paid any taxes whatsoever. And we wonder why, you know, Elizabeth Warren's freaking out, screaming at the top of her lungs saying, hey, $50 billion has not been re recovered from, you know, these, these crypto billionaires, which is another whole thing, these trillionaires that we should talk about at some point. But uh, they create, I think, create their own market. Um, so, so, like, I found Node for to be fascinating because I like uh, forensics, risk management, fraud, reporting, big data, analytics, always get the greatest premium in every market. Okay. And so when I saw, we had the opportunity to look at Node 40, I have a background in building technology companies. Um, it was a instant love affair for me because I was like, wow, I get to be at the very center. <clears throat> pardon me. I get to be at the very center of the entire digital complex, dealing with the largest companies in the world, including the enforcement authorities. I didn't know that when I invested in initially. I uh, get the, the rich intel of financial context around digital assets, who's doing what, when, and where, volumes being traded. All these traders are very different too. There's high frequency traders. There's long-term traders like me. There's guys like you starting to play around with it. There'll be day traders, um, swing traders. There'll be all kinds of different traders, um, but they all have something in common, which is, hey, how, how do we get proper reporting in such a way that it doesn't cost us an arm and a leg, right? Uh, for instance, um, and this is part of the problem, a large top four accounting firm in the United States, one of the biggest, greatest quality of earnings company in the world. They will have 30 or 40,000 digital asset clients. And last year they got to 30 of them. The, the labor to search through, compress and analyze all this data and place it into a format that's readable for the professional around the investor, and that's what I discovered about two years ago. Oh, it's the professionals around these investors, the risk manager, the tax guy, the accounting guy, the lawyer, who, you know, they're, those guys are normally a lot older than most crypto guys, and they don't have the understanding of blockchain, Bitcoin, or Dogecoin, or, you know, air swaps, or airdrops, or uh, staking. Like and every IRS, DOJ, CFTC. None of them. None of them. Okay. So this is not, this is a new world. Uh, what we've done in Node 40 is we have, in, in part to my background in trading commodities, we've created a technology solution that accomplishes what the big four can't do, which is, hey, it takes us 500 hours to analyze data of a half a million dollar digital asset client. Now, half, half 500 hours, let's assume their cost is 200 bucks an hour. That's $100,000 to review a $500,000 crypto position. That is not sustainable, okay? They're gonna lose a client. They're gonna piss off a client. Um, and by the way, they're gonna piss off the other 29,700 clients they couldn't even address because their technology, they started building the technology three or four months ago or two years ago. This needed to get built five years ago, okay? So Node 40 started building this five years ago to solve their own internal problem. I love businesses like that where the founders have a problem and they realize, oh, no one's doing this. I'm going to figure out my own bloody problem because I have to. They were living in New York and they were scared of the tax man in New York. And you should be if you're in New York. Um, and they were, those guys have a technology understand. They sit in that bandwidth of 
mentally of, of technology and I sit in the bandwidth of building businesses and being commercial, the the pair, the, the grouping of us together was so much more valuable to them than just some passive money. Um, so I think I invested $4 million about two years ago. We're doing another round right now that I'm really excited about that I think takes us to a multi-billion dollar company. Um, and that's why you get excited about Bitcoin, right? Because this is an industry that's literally in like maybe the first two hours of a nine-inning game that uh, has yet to have real, real serious players come into it until very, very recently. And I'll end with this on this comment. But when Gary Gensler says digital asset industry has become an asset class, that is game over now, okay? You have Larry Fink. This is now a sustainable asset class. They're not saying that it's an asset. They're saying that Bitcoin and digital commerce is an asset class. That is a very, very important terminology because that tells every pension company, every family office, every invest professional investor, if you're not a part of this asset class, you're going to get penalized. So yeah, they all invest in all eight or nine or 10 sectors or asset classes. <laughs> They will participate in this one once it's labeled as such. Right. And, and you they're know, going to expect the same tools that they've been used to reporting to their board, their risk management teams, right? They need the tools. And that's all we're doing. We're creating institutional grade risk management tools that would tell any professional, any manager, any boss, any board what your position is today from a third eye, not from an internal perspective, well, hey, these are my books today, but getting a third eye of risk management, same for enforcement authorities, uh, Interpol, anyone chasing the money, hey, there's a bad trade here, somebody did something naughty. Do they care about the bad trade? Sure they did. Do they want to know how much money was lost in the bad trade? Absolutely they did, right? So that's what Node 40 is. It's, it's going to end up serving the biggest companies in the world, the, all the accounting and tax firms that need to do these reports, they are not going to build their own solutions. Okay, it's one is too late. Two, you have no history of any large company building any software. Google's bought it all. Facebook bought it all. These companies buy solutions; they don't build solutions anymore. And the reason you buy them is because you're running out of time. These markets roll. They get started without everybody being prepped and ready, right? We now have Ferraris driving down the road at 300 miles an hour, but there's no highway been built. There's no road rails. There's no guard post. That's why we're, we've had a bunch of trouble and criminal activities in the space because there's no monitoring of anything that's going on. That's going to change um, because the rails are getting put in place. So it's, it's uh, to me... Like there's so many opportunities in this space, Greg. You can buy Bitcoin. You can buy a company in Bitcoin. You can work for a company in Bitcoin. I mean, we you can invest in a company that's doing all of that. So you don't have to totally. worry about it. You can just say, look, I just want exposure. And so like right now you said you're raising. So you have opportunities for accredited investors only, right? To uh, invest in Node40 right now. Yeah. Okay. So I'll put the link in the notes below the video for anybody interested. So they can go click it. They can download the deck see the video, see what it's all about. What's fascinating to me, I mean, this is a unicorn quickly, I think, in, in you know, 12, 14 months, I think you're going to be a unicorn. And what's really interesting about it is, so when you talk about the compliance piece, so it's not just, it's not just the big four and it's not just investors. I mean, you're talking about corporations that want exposure for their treasury. They, you know, in order, in order for them to pass compliance, they need the reporting. So you're opening up the doors for corporations now to expose themselves through their treasury to the asset space. You're looking at the IRS, the CFTC, the DOJ that needs your technology to be able to do what they're doing. Um, and then you've got just the general accounting. And let's talk about that piece a little bit. So you said you gave us this the use case, you know, 500 hours, $100,000 for 500, you know, $500,000 position. What would that look like with Node 40? How quickly does Node 40 track every transaction across all exchanges and drill that down so that they've got the reporting for that $500,000 position now. Uh, 
So with the example I gave you, the accounting firm only being able to get to 30 of 30,000. First off, you have to assume that these are $25,000 events, at least, you know, mostly most accounting firms, you go to them and they, hey, we need to retain them for 25 grand. So assume 25,000 is the average fee. I mean, we have clients pay a lot more because their positions are much more complex, but you know, you have 30, clients doing like billions of transactions a year, right? Or something like that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. High no, frequency we, trades. Yeah. We, we focus on the very top end of the market, like the most complex. Cause my view was, Hey, you handle the most complex, the e the smaller guys are easy to handle. We, we're not a consumer business though. I don't want to be a consumer business. Uh, we are an institutional business, right? I, I'm not interested in selling anything for a hundred bucks. Um, but if you go back to uh, a top four guy, 25,000, 30,000 clients, 30,000 clients, $700 million in revenue, first off, that company is not going to get this year. $700 million in revenue. They're not going to get, and their clients are going to be pissed off. Um, it's, it, it just takes too long for them to compress this data, assuming they can get it correctly. They gave us three of the 30 files. I can pretty much assume they gave us the most difficult three. This is what all, all these guys did. And we did all three in less than one hour. And that we, tracked oh, every single transaction across every, every exchange. Oh, oh, they will tell you right now. Oh, they did it perfectly. Okay, we, our balances zero out or we don't send you the file. I mean, it zeroes out where out to eight digits, we're maybe 0 0.003 cents on a billion dollars in transactions. It, it, it's a, literally one penny is our deviation on a billion transactions. Um, again, we did three of them in less than one hour at a cost that was 10% of what they pay per file. So really 3%, right? Because we did three of them. And we can do this in size on scale all day long because we built it to do this. We didn't build it to solve an internal problem. We built it to solve an industry problem. The scale on that is I need 30,000. So for the accredited investors that you're going to pitch to, I need 30, I will make $72 million. Node 40 is going to do $70 million in 2027 with 30,000 customers. So we're assuming it takes us three and a half years to get to 30,000 customers. I, I think we can probably do it quicker than that. 30,000 out of 50 million. And we've assumed we only ever target the US market and we never get another digital asset owner in the United States. There's no ads, the market doesn't grow, which is ridiculous. Um, and we only get the 30,000 clients. We don't get any Interpol, internet, uh, IRS. We get no private public work, okay? Uh, we get no litigation work, which is there's litigations going on like A to day. Uh, guess what they're gonna have to hire? Audits and forensics. How much damage was done, okay? Uh, they bought it at this, they sold it at this. How much damage was done? What, what's the consequence? of this theft, uh, there'll be two forensics at least provided in every one of those litigations. So I look at this and go, my God, dude, we'll be doing a hundred million dollars. Um, I mean, we got chain analysis picks up a $54 million contract from the IRS. One, uh, they're, they're worth $6.8 billion on $150 million worth of revenue. So this market is really, really, really early. I mean, we built a half a billion dollar business in chargebacks and that wasn't mandated. This is mandated, okay? Um, this is ha now has the seal of approval from the US government. This is an asset class. So once it's an asset class, they're basically telling you, hey, we're gonna get our piece, okay? We're gonna get our piece. They have uh, a, an approved budget. The IRS has got an approved expanded budget of $55 billion, both the, approved by the Republicans and 
the Democrats to expand their operation, what do you think they're going to be focused on? I think they're going to probably put a lot of attention on crypto and the taxes that they have not received and any of the accounting that needs to get sorted out. So until these tools are available, you're not going to see family offices and big, big, big places like the Fidelities come in. When we showed Fidelity this tool, they started laughing. They went, oh, well, looks like our tool. I'm like, exactly. See, Fidelity knows already. The crypto guys are the only people that believe that they're unique. The crypto guys will use the exact same tools that a crude oil trader is or an FX trader. Like, it's just going to be the same. And you want that to be the same basic dashboard, right? You don't want to get into a new Range Rover and go, oh, my God, man, the dashboard's in the rear seat, right? I don't know how to run this vehicle anymore. You, you want the same kind of dashboard, even though the engine is more complex. Yeah, I mean, it's what you need for compliance for the new asset industry, uh, the new asset class industry. So asset class, you know, cash, stocks, bonds, gold, real estate, those are asset classes. Now you have crypto that's an asset class, Bitcoin, other cryptocurrencies with compliance now can become a rated industry that brings in family office, hedge fund, or uh, life funds, sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, things like that. I mean, that's what really opens up opportunity in the space. Great. Yeah, that's yeah. exciting. Yeah, yeah. And, and listen, I like I stay away from this whole unicorn thing, but I do think you're right. I think this is a like you can walk you could watch this unicorn get made. Um, I just needed the first two years. I needed the four million dollars was really to get everything lined out on strategy and basically cookie cut what I had done before with the team that I had that I was lucky enough to find. And, and this team is like, it's been awesome to have a technology team that wants to focus on technology and they trust me to, uh, you know, really drill in the right commercials and the right strategy um, for this company. The, uh, I mean, you've just seen the recent deck. I mean, I'm so proud of that deck because this is not a Gary deck. They did that deck. They own this product and the way our company is, uh, the storyline for our company today, they own this. And it's really cool to see them going, hey, we're a totally different company than we were two years ago. And it just required a little bit of a tweak on what, one, what don't we do? That was the first question I asked the guys. Okay, let's decide what we don't do. And they were like, huh? So look, if we decide what we don't do, we won't have to have any of those discussions. Okay, we are not going to sell sell anything to anyone for 150 bucks. Next, oh, we have 2,000 clients. Call them up and tell them it's 2,000 dollars. We're going to lose them all. Awesome. See you. Bye. We'll keep seven of them and make more money. And then that allowed us to get rid of jettison all the crap that was holding us back. Jettison any people that were. Oh, we can't be a billion dollar company. I joined to be a $25 million company. Got to get rid of those guys. Founders don't think about that sometimes. Hey, the guys you hired may not get you to the billion dollars because they didn't join a billion dollar dream. They built, they joined the McDonald's dream to have one franchise. That's it. They didn't want the big journey. Um, so that takes, you know, a good amount of time and it took that much time to really survey the market and really understand what the needs of the, the market are. We've probably met with 200 of the top accounting tax firms in the world, uh, already met with the IRS and a couple of other you know, agencies. We thought that would take us forever. It's, the need is so great. It's amazing how fast things can get approved when the need is great. And then the big institutions, we did not expect the Black Rock, Rocks to show up this quick. Uh, every ETF will be audited. Every ETF will be audited, okay? Uh, in fact, I think everything is going to be audited. Every, like, if you're playing in the space, we tell everyone, prepare for the audit, okay? This space is going to be audited because it can be. They have the budget to audit it, and we think you guys are the weak link, okay? Your reporting sucks. 
You can't, you have to have reporting that's so ginned in that the guy asking the question just goes away because your data is so clear and transparent. There's no need to not be transparent, okay? Like this, if you're trying to hide or do naughty things, this is not the industry you should be doing it in. It, you're going to be discovered. Uh, like we can already identify clients that are problems. Like we pitch them 12 minutes later, they're like, hey, thanks a lot, appreciate it, see you. They run away, okay? Like we pitch this to FTX. They ran away with their tail in between their legs. We know immediately, like, uh-oh, this guy does not like transparency. Well, if you don't like transparency, don't call us. Uh, but if you want to be positioned so that your professionals, your tax guy, your accountant, your wife, your, your, divorced, uh, your, your, your divorced wife who's suing you, uh, for some of your assets, and she's made, she said, or he's saying, hey, look, your Bitcoin position's crazy. Um, but you're going to need forensics for this stuff, right? And, and to Greg's case, he's not even trading a lot. And it took him, it took him a tremendous amount. It took my tax guy, uh, he charged me 40 grand, took him one week to look at four exchanges where I only had buys. Over four years, charged me 40 grand, five days of work, literally 60 hours of some girl, uh, Amy, I think her name was. And they told me I owed $700,000 in taxes. And I said, how can I owe $700,000 in taxes when I never sold it? They saw Coinbase to Coinbase Pro as an event, an exchange to an exchange, a wallet to a wallet is a liquidation event. So, I mean, really think with that, right? Now it don't, oh my God, my professionals, the guys that are supposed to help me are my problem. How can I get them boned up for the quiz? I showed them Node 40. Literally, we're in a room with a bunch of lawyers one day and they said, hey man, you know the Node 40 data, the Node 40 data, the Node 40 data. They're not even talking about their own data anymore. They're literally going, hey, if we go to, and then once I was able to give them note 40, they didn't have to do any work. They saw the data. They were able to go, hey, you know, you could take a tax loss over there. Uh, you could do this as a capital earnings gain here. And then you could make this loss show up through Bitcoin by selling all your Bitcoin or going to buy the company, taking a tax loss. I educated, I had, I put information in front of my professionals so they could educate me properly, right? We knew all our options. We didn't know part of the options. And I wasn't, they weren't in dark on part of my position that when you bring this subject up, right? People are immediately like, go a little bit, ooh, I've heard about Bitcoin. You know, ooh, you know, ooh, you must be selling drugs online, right? That, that's what some of these people think, right? Because they haven't studied it like we have. Well, you know, that's an awesome project. Um, we've, we've burned up an hour and a half already. Can you believe that? Amazing, man. It's amazing when you get excited. Virtual world. Well, I appreciate you taking some time out to share your story and what you're doing. And uh, I'll put the links to all that uh, in the video below for everybody to reach out. And I look forward to uh, doing this again soon. Greg, you're awesome. Thank you so much, buddy.